When you're out there on the water every day for that long, you see how things have changed. It's hard knowing there's nothing you can do but watch. My name is Bob Ingersoll, and I'm a farmer. The demand for our kind of work is only going up, and we're constantly looking at how to expand our yield without stripping the land or polluting the bay. The Chesapeake Conservancy has been focused on creating tools that help answer some of these questions. In the infancy of the Chesapeake Bay program, scientists built a scale physical model of the bay to understand how processes worked and to simulate potential solutions. A lot has changed since then, and technology has been the catalyst. The Chesapeake Conservancy has been a pioneer in the field of precision conservation, getting the right practices in the right places, but it hasn't always been easy. Until recently, land cover data was only available at 30 meters resolution and represented what the landscape looked like seven years ago. Not great for precision planning. We raised the support and spent 18 months working with our partners to create a one meter land cover database for the Chesapeake Bay program. This unprecedented project took a lot of effort and massive computing power. Now we are working with Microsoft and using AI and deep learning to accelerate our work both in the Chesapeake and across the country. Our collaboration is aimed at providing partners with the information they need to make informed decisions. The Microsoft Cloud is freeing up organizations to spend less time on technology and more time on conservation. Working with a conservancy, I am now able to restore and protect my lands with the same level of precision that I grow my crops. This allows me to focus on what I need to do, provide food for people while sustaining the land and the bay. I love this water. I love this work. It's a special place out here, and it's up to us to protect it. Now I'd like to hand it over to Annie Burgess to tell us just a little bit about Funding Friday prep, um, and then we will get going. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's excited to be kicking off a morning, switching things up on our EEC last official day of the ESIP summer virtual meeting. Uh, 63 people already, okay. So um, again, good morning. My name is Annie Burgess. I'm the lab director here at ESIP. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit, or I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about a unique event we hold each summer called Funding Friday, or as I like to think of it, get ready folks. Funding Friday. Funding Friday, Funding Friday, Funding Friday, mini grants. I just wrote that. Can you believe my lyrical talents on a Thursday morning? So in the spirit of that, you could think of Funding Friday as this uh, uniquely ESIP, fun, uh, rapid fire mini grant competition where attendees come up with an idea, create a poster and give us a two minute pitch for a chance to win one of three uh, $5,000 member prizes or three $3,000, pardon me, awards to students or educators. So if you'd like to participate, I would encourage you to uh, create a poster using Google Draw. So you can see on the slide an example of one that I created on the left. Um, you would have to send it to me at lab at esipfed.org by 9 p.m. tonight. And then tomorrow morning, uh, show up at the Funding Friday pitch session and give a two minute pitch about the poster. Um, so there are some eligibility uh, restrictions related to uh, attending the meeting and presenting. Um, and there's more information on the specific rules at the page that you see. So you can either scan the QR code that you see on the page or visit bit.ly slash ESIPFF20. 
Um, and so please go ahead and visit that. That is the Kiko Chat page for Funding Friday. You can take a little bit more of a closer look at the example, see some tips and tricks for making a great Funding Friday poster, see links to previous Funding Friday awarded posters, and get the full set of rules. And if you have any questions, I would really encourage you to put them in the chat here, as I'm sure there are many seasoned ESIP Funding Friday participants that would love to answer them for you. So again, use the chat to uh, pass along Funding Friday ideas. You can go into the Funding Friday space at any time um, and check it out and see, uh, we have some spaces set up for you to make your posters. And again, we're excited to see what gets presented tomorrow morning. So with that, I'm even more excited, I don't know how many times I've said that this morning, to introduce uh, Susan Shingledecker. And Susan is ESIP's new executive director starting full-time in October, and we couldn't be more excited to have her here. So Susan, over to you. Thank you, Annie. Um, I am so excited to be here. I, I really mean that. Um, I, I wanted to take a couple minutes to introduce myself as I have not had the chance to meet all of you yet and I'm really looking forward to that. And I wanna really first thank the selection committee, the board and the staff for believing in me. We've had a number of conversations um, starting this spring going into June and with each conversation, my excitement and my interest in ESIP grew. And I knew that I had to do whatever I could to be here for as much of the summer meeting as possible. Um, and I am really grateful to have two months to work with Aaron um, to ensure a really smooth and efficient transition into meeting all of you um, in that time. Um, at the board meeting earlier this week, there was a lot of praise for Aaron, and it was really fun for me to see the community's love for her and the impact that she has had. And um, I am just really honored to, to follow in her footsteps, and I hope to deliver on, on what she has built um, with all of you, and I'm really excited about that. Um, as you know from that video, um, I am coming to you from the Chesapeake Conservancy. And so when Dan suggested that video, um, it, was, it was wonderful. Um, I have helped to lead a team um, of over 40 people who work to create data-driven conservation solutions in the Chesapeake um, that have real on-the-ground impacts, both with behavior change and also changing the system, changing the policy, changing the models, changing the way decision is made um, in the largest ecosystem in the country. Um, or the largest um, estuary in the country, I meant to say. Um, and um, it's been a really fun journey there and I am really excited to come to ESIP. Um, as with, with every conversation in the last week and a half, my excitement has grown. Um, I knew that ESIP was a community um, who takes a collaborative approach to solving the world's greatest challenges. But being immersed in this community the last week and a half, um, I, I, it's, I really feel it, I really see it. Um, I see how federal and state and academic and nonprofit and private sector partners come together in a way that really isn't replicated anywhere else. Um, and I've really had a fun time rolling up our sleeves and seeing how you tackle the greatest problems facing our planet. Um, how you say, how can data be used in the COVID-19 crisis? What's gonna happen when hurricane season starts? How can we play a role in, 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 in finding solutions there? What is, you know, what can be done more about the water quality problems in Flint, Michigan, and how can we bring data-driven solutions to make that happen? Um, and so I, I look at the energy and the enthusiasm that this group brings to these challenges, and I, um, I know that this is the place I'm meant to be. Um, and I am really excited to be proud of this community and to lead us forward. Um, and I look forward to getting to know all of you. Um, with that, I want to introduce our first plenary speaker. Um, Dan Morris is principal scientist at Microsoft, where he runs the AI for Earth program, focusing on accelerating innovation at the intersection of machine learning and sustainability. Um, I've personally seen the results of Dan's work in the AI for Earth program grants um, and their support in my work at Chesapeake Conservancy. Dan noted yesterday that they don't just give money or Azure credits, but their team really works with their grantees. And that's what we saw at the Conservancy. And that work and support has really fueled a small regional organization to do amazing things. So I'm proud to introduce him and his talk. Take it away, Dan. Hey, everyone. Oh, I'm trying to start my video, but I think that somebody on your end click the magic button that says I can't start my video. It's OK. You can find a picture I'm, of me on the internet. I'm nobody working, needs, nobody I'm needs to know what it. I look like. There's pictures of me on the internet. 
Uh, okay, I think you should be able to do it now. Try hey, now. Hey, here I am. I hope this Yay. is really satisfying. I look exactly like I do on the internet. So there you go, mission accomplished. Um, cool. Now we're not seeing your screen. Not yet. You will. You'll know when there's pictures of animals. All right, here we go. Now you got me on my screen. Hey, everyone. I'm Dan. I run the AI for Earth program at Microsoft. I'm going to talk some today about accelerating environmental science workflows with computer vision. Um, you know, anybody who's seen me speak before, including earlier this week, you know, I always start my talks, no matter what I'm talking about, with pretty pictures of animals because it puts everybody in a good mood. But for anybody who saw me speak in a panel on Tuesday, I want you to appreciate that I do change the pictures of animals when I give a new talk. I'm not so lazy that I just reuse the same pictures of animals. So new pictures of animals to get everybody's morning off in a, everybody in a good mood for the morning. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, obviously, I'm going to talk about what the title says, Accelerating Computer Vision Workflows uh, with Computer Vision. Um, but along the way, I want to tell you what AI for Earth is a little bit. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, this being ESIP, uh, what Earth observation data means to us and our grantees and how we use it. Uh, and then this being the public-private partnership session, I am going to tell you a little bit about what that means to us. Hopefully, keep it pretty lightweight. It's a 15-minute talk, and it's the morning. So I just want to give you some ideas about what AI for Earth is and what Earth observation and public-private partnerships mean to us. Um, so quick summary of what we are, AI for Earth. Uh, we're kind of three things. I'll talk about each of them a little bit. Uh, we are a grants program. We give stuff away. I'll tell you more in a second about the kind of stuff we give away. We are a data program, so we're responsible for hosting environmental science data, particularly Earth observation data on Azure. And then we also build machine learning tools, primarily for accelerating conservation workflows with computer vision, as per title of the talk. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about our grants program, so just take from this slide, we give lots of grants, we give Azure credits, and we give money. And if you want to learn more about our grants program, uh, check out this URL. Go learn all about our grants program and the different types of grants we give away. Uh, what I what I am going to do uh, is tell you a little bit about a couple of our grantees who are using Earth observation data in exciting ways uh, to kind of paint the picture of uh, how lots of our grantees are using Earth observation data. Uh, so for example, one of our grantees is a small company called Silvia Terra. Uh, that we think is a great example of how machine learning and uh, Earth observation data can be leveraged to create new markets to incentivize carbon sequestration. Uh, so more than half of the forests in the US are privately owned. Uh, and unless we can create an efficient market that disincentivizes landowners from moving those trees, we will lose our most powerful natural carbon sink. And of course, creating that kind of market requires knowing where our forests are and how much carbon they can sequester. And it requires being able to track changes to those forests once a landholder guarantees that they will pre preserve forest cover. And this is where Silvia Terra comes in. So Silvia Terra has used uh, machine learning uh, and in particular Landsat and NAEP data and other earth observation sources, primarily public sources, to map uh, about 500, over 500 million acres of forest uh, at extremely high resolution, often down to the individual tree species um, across the whole US. And so this is the first time that this, this caliber of uh, species level nationwide forest industry uh, inventory has been produced. And we think this is a really exciting new way. Uh, not only is it super cool science and super exciting use of machine learning and earth observation data, uh, but really potentially transformative uh, in the way that we're able to incentivize forest cover preservation uh, and, um, and create new uh, carbon markets. And on top of that, this is also, it's also really exciting to see Sylvia Terra as a startup. This is not an academic project. It's really exciting to see translational work like this, leveraging machine learning on the cloud and leveraging a public earth observation data here. We love those stories. So I'll give you one more. Uh, another one of our uh, grantees is a company called Ag Analytics uh, that also uses earth observation data uh, to support farmers in uh, field level crop yield and uh, and crop profit prediction based on a variety of sources, some of them ground sourced, but many of them also remote sensing data sources. Uh, in fact, they make extensive use of the uh, the harmonized Landsat Sentinel data that many of you are probably familiar with. In fact, they're so excited about it that they are actually maintain. If you go show you talk about our data hosting in a bit, we have uh, we mirror the harmonized Landsat Sentinel data on Azure and it's Ag Analytics that actually maintains that archive uh, maintains the uh, Azure Public uh, Open Data Sets archive of the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel data because it's so important to what they do to providing field level information to their customers, to farmers. Uh, again, we think this is a, a fantastic combination of uh, machine learning, earth observation data, 
and the cloud uh, to build uh, a high value translational application. So these are the ones that get, although we don't exclusively grant to startups, we love talking about these applications because it really does paint the long-term promise of how important this kind of data and this kind of machine learning work is. I wish I could tell you all 600 stories, of course, about our grantees, but I don't want to tell you 600 grantee stories. So I encourage you to go check out our AF Earth grantee gallery at this, uh, at this URL. I'm going to let you stare at that for a second because our grantees are really the heart of our program. And we uh, really want people to check out the stories of the great work that they're doing on Azure. I'm going to talk about a lot of work that we're doing, but really what I want you to go see is the work that our grantees are doing. Um, I mentioned we are also a data program. Here's a cool thumbnails of a whole bunch of data sets we're hosting, many of which most of you are familiar with. Um, so we are responsible for making sure that particularly large geospatial data sets primarily uh, Earth observation data, satellite and aerial imagery, though not exclusively. Um, we're responsible for making sure those are available on Azure and easy to use and accessible on Azure. Uh, our data program is relatively young, and though we're trying our best to make this data useful and accessible on Azure, when I give talks like this, the reason I show that slide and talk about our data program is that you, the people listening to this talk right now, are exactly the people we need feedback from to make sure that we are making this data as useful and accessible as possible. So we want to hear from you about the public data sets you use. We want to hear all the minutia that you love and hate about file formats. Uh, and we want to hear your experiences with the data that we host and the data that other clouds host. Uh, because uh, like I said, our data program is young. We have a lot of flexibility to steer from big questions about what data we are and are hosting all the way down to small questions about file formats and documentation. So please drop us an email, afearthdatasets at microsoft.com if you have lots of, if you have thoughts, if you just want to vent about geospatial data file formats, which we know people love to do, feel free, afearthdatasets at microsoft.com. We will vent with you. Uh, and we also make uh, a substantial amount of effort around what we think of as small data, uh, which really by that we mean here, the volume of the data isn't our contribution. Yes, Microsoft has giant racks of hard drives that are important to hosting large geospatial data sets. But in order to accelerate work around machine learning for conservation, we also need uh, to pair that with well curated training and benchmark data. And we put a lot of time into uh, helping the community uh, develop and host labeled training data, particularly around wildlife conservation. Most data of this flavor uh, ends up at this repository that we host with, that we manage with a couple of external partners, lila.science. Uh, so a lot of wildlife conservation data there, also some uh, aerial imagery and some land cover, uh, labeled land cover data. So if you're interested in uh, playing with machine learning data for conservation, please do go check out lila.science. And if there's data sets we should be hosting or don't know about, please drop us an email about that too. Small data is every bit as important as big data to us. Okay, so that was our the grants and data part of our program. I mentioned there's a third part of our program, which is building tools that help conservation scientists do their work more efficiently. Overall, uh, this our take here is we're not so much about telling environmental scientists about new applications that they should be doing with machine learning on the cloud. Rather, we really try hard, very consistent with every Microsoft commercial you've ever seen about empowering our customers. We try really hard to empower our customers to do the work that they know is important more efficiently. Or put another way, as we're sitting here on this talk, there are environmental scientists all over the world doing something super, super boring that isn't the most efficient use of their time, that is delaying answers to critical conservation questions. And we'd like to use machine learning and computer vision in particular to help scientists answer their conservation questions more quickly. Uh, and we do this across a whole bunch of different areas, but all kind of in the same theme. There's something that's really time consuming. We don't think that we're going to be able to automate that, at least not before I retire someday. We're a long way from automation, but we think there's huge opportunity for dramatic acceleration of the work that people are doing in this area with computer vision. So if you ever hear me claim to automate anything, I owe you a fancy latte. Uh, we really try to talk about accelerating, not automating. Um, and I'm going to just dive into a couple of these in a little bit more detail, maybe like one to two slides each. Uh, one of our more mature projects in this area is around uh, accelerating the processing of images from motion triggered camera traps for wildlife surveys. And the story here is really clean. If you are, you want to study one or all species in an ecosystem and you're a conservation biologist, you might go put out anywhere from one to 500 motion triggered cameras to take pictures of all the animals in an area. And then you're going to go home for six months and then you're going to come back and you're going to pull SD cards off of all those cameras. 
And you're going to have somewhere between 5,000 and 50 million images that you now have to sort through. And that is not only an inefficient use of limited conservation resources, but it's going to take a really long time to annotate those images. And you put those cameras out for a reason. You had a conservation question you needed to ask that may impact short-term policy and decision making. And if it takes you a year to annotate those images, we've missed an opportunity. And so we really want to use computer vision to accelerate that annotation process. Um, there is a because this is such a clear and important problem, there's a ton of work in the computer vision literature around camera traps in particular. Most of it focuses on species classification. We are not a computer vision research group. We have taken a much more applied approach to this space and specifically focus, again, we're all about where's, how can we save time for people today? So we focus on some of the less glamorous problems in this area, particularly around helping people get rid of images that aren't animals at all. Uh, images that are primarily people and empty. That is a huge time suck for a lot of projects like this. Uh, and we also focus on rather than building a new tool and asking people to learn Microsoft Camera Trap System 2020 Professional Edition, to just trying to add our best to integrate the machine learning work we do into the existing workflows and tools that people are already using. And this is really a theme throughout all of the work we do in this area. Um, don't ask people to uh, use brand new tools, but rather fit into what they're doing already. And I'll, we do a little bit of work on species classification, and it is really glamorous and exciting. But most of our work is focused on uh, the seemingly more mundane but very important problems of just in the tools that people are already using, helping them get rid of the really boring and uninteresting stuff. If this were a longer talk, I would show you a demo now. But instead, I'm just going to let you look at this easy to remember URL for just a second and encourage you to go tinker with our demo uh, after this talk is over. Um, got it, AKMS camera trap demo. Don't all go play with it at the same time. I don't know what will happen if you do that, but sometime, you know, exponential back off over the next few hours, everybody go tinker with our camera trap demo and I think you'll get the idea. Um, Accelerating head a little bit. We do a very similar type of work around land cover mapping. Maybe I don't even have to talk about this too much because I got uh, my lead in was that fantastic high production value video that talked really about the gist of this work. But the story again is the same uh, classifying land use in aerial satellite or drone imagery takes an obscene amount of time. Machine learning is not ready to automate that yet, but machine learning is very much ready to accelerate that, that dramatically. Uh, and so we've done a lot of work uh, with the Chesapeake Conservancy and with others to build machine learning models that accelerate the process of land cover mapping. The one thing I'll add, so where that video left things, so I'm going to fast forward a couple slides. Everybody see the flash by you, the Princess Bride reference there? I wish I could fit that joke in, but I don't have time for it. Um, this is really where that video left off. Uh, let's go and build a model that produces a uh, high resolution land cover map of the entire continent of the US. This is primarily based on NAEP imagery. So it's not only this, the goal at the time we started this project and made that video uh, was to produce a high resolution land cover map of the US across all years that NAEP imagery is available. And that is a fantastic goal. Did we do it? Well, we built a high resolution land cover map. You can see it at this URL, AKMS land cover demo, which I also would show you if this were a longer talk. This one, you can all go hit at the same time. This one is really uh, low cost. So everybody can go tinker with this URL right now. Um, and that will show you the one meter resolution land cover map that we built. And so that's great, right? This was our goal. We built a high resolution land cover map and we totally solved the problem. And no geospatial analyst ever had to do manual land cover mapping again. Of course, that's not exactly what happened. Many of you are probably doing that between talks at ESIP. This is still a largely manual process. And the reason is that this is just really hard. Everybody's problem is a little bit different. Uh, the further away you get from your training data, the worse any, even the best model performs. Everybody's class set is a little bit different. Some people care about seven different categories of grassland and some people don't. Um, and so really over the last year, the direction this work has taken is to pivot from, um, let's go build an amazing high resolution land cover map to let's build tools that give people a reasonable starting point and use machine learning to get their land cover mapping tasks done more efficiently. Uh, or in other words, if you take the demo I linked to a couple slides ago that shows your high resolution land cover map, really the last one to two years of this work have been about adding two buttons to that UI. And I know that sounds small, but those two buttons are a big deal in terms of machine learning workflows. Uh, where that work is now is you can add new classes dynamically uh, because like I said, everybody's problem is a little bit different. Some people want R4 class, 
water, forest, field, and built structure model, and some people don't. Uh, so being able to dynamically add classes and then quickly and iteratively retrain the model to fit your needs, to fit different image sources, has really been the focus of our work now. And again, it took us a long time to learn this, but Accelerate Not Automate has really been the focus of our work for the last year or so on this project. And I am at time now, so I'm going to fast forward again to the slide with my, you can hear public private partnerships. You can ask me all about that either in questions or at that email address. And I will sign off now since I'm at time. Thank you for that, Dan. Um, it looks like we have time for a couple of questions. So I'm going into Slido and I'm going to pose those for you. Um, so when someone accesses data through Azure, are they able to understand how they can cite those data resources? Um, so it varies by data set. You know, the different types of data sets have, um, we, whenever we host data, we always try to provide as much information as we can to make sure the data owner gets cited, uh, gets credit for the work they put into creating that data set. So if you look at lila.science, for example, that's our small data repository. Almost all, for every data set there, you'll see very clear citation information about if you use this, please cite the following paper. Um, as is always the case, we try to do the same for the public domain large geospatial data sets we host. And as many of you know, they vary in how much the data, there is a clear citation and in how much the data owner cares to get cited, but we always try to provide citation information. And for the small data that uh, you know a small number of people have put a lot of heart and soul into, I think we're at about 100% about providing clear citation information with broader data, um, you know, uh, like Landsat, um, there is sometimes it's a little, it's not a single paper to point to in the same way, but we do everything we can to provide that. And if we're missing something, email AI for Earth datasets at Microsoft.com to let us know we're missing something. And then um, another question from Ed Armstrong. Um, Dan, it looks like you have a lot of applications of surveying land wildlife resources. Any applications in the ocean realm like marine mammal surveys? Great question. Amongst the slides that I paged through very quickly at the end in public-private partnerships, uh, we have done a couple of projects, most specifically with NOAA Fisheries, who are conveniently located here in Seattle near where we are and have been a fountain of great machine learning projects with us. We have done work with them on accelerating their uh, air polar aerial surveys, primarily for seal populations. And most recently, uh, on accelerating their bioacoustic surveys for uh, for beluga whales in the greater Pacific Northwest area. I'll, I have to say, um, we try to help people spend less time doing boring stuff. The camera trap images are pretty boring. The acoustic and aerial images are egregiously boring. And so we try to help people uh, with that. And we have done a bunch of work with NOAA Fisheries on aerial surveys, acoustic surveys. And then most recently, uh, we have an ongoing project with them uh, where they are doing some video surveys of primarily fish populations also in the in the greater Northwest area. And we're trying to help them accelerate those too. Um, the, all of the, the beluga whale work and aerial work is already public and you can go see it at the biodiversity surveys URL that I talked about earlier. That has, that's all open source and is pretty much wrapped up. Great, thanks for that. Um, another question from, from Dan Fuca. How does Microsoft AI for Earth balance the commercial, the commercial commercializable and fair data access desires and needs of the scientific community when evaluating grants? I'm going to, I don't know if the person can answer me because I'm going to ask a question. I think, are you, are you asking about, um, let me, let me, uh, I don't know. I'll give an answer and somebody can tell me if this answers the question. We give grants to all kinds of organizations. We give grants to startups. We give grants to NGOs. Um, we give grants to academia. There are certain types of grants that we give where uh, the open release of data is a contingency on the grant. That is not the norm. Uh, for the most part, when we, per, when we get, have RFP-based grants where a majority of those grants are going to academics, it is the norm that data will end up being publicly released. But at the same time, we also want to incentivize, we want to help startups too. And obviously it's not always in there, it's not always feasible for them to release their data products publicly. Um, we almost always try to find some middle ground where there's a low resolution version that can be released publicly, uh, or there is a, a free tier of an API that can be accessed publicly to access that data. Um, but we try to mix our, I'll call it grants portfolio across data that does result in both the consumption and production of public domain data. But then we also wanna make sure we're all supporting startups because at the end of the day, what we wanna do is invest in conservation and 
uh, sometimes businesses like Sylvia Terranag Analytics that I talked about earlier, if they released everything they did, there would be no sustainable business there. And we think that's equally important. I'd say if you look across our portfolio, um, by number of grants, the substantial majority are NGOs and academics who generally end up releasing their work publicly. But the, the startup grants we give are equally important to us. And it is not often the case that they can release their data publicly. Great answer, and I see from um, the chat that that was that was the answer he was looking for. Also, so um, another comment um, from Dave Jones: just great presentation. Love the NOAA and other data you have in Azure, and would love to use it if it were offered as web services, so we can access and share it across multiple platforms. This could really show the power of cloud processing and also product delivery. Great segue. So, yes, right now is the data we host is sort of uh, I'll call it bare bones. Azure blob storage, the files are there. We try really hard to provide good examples and documentation to make them as easy to use as possible, but, but by and large, they are not accessed through an API. Uh, when I give a talk next year at ESIP, what I hope to say, really our meet, there's been kind of a significant pivot for the Air for Earth program this year, is building a layer of infrastructure on top of this that we announced in April as our planetary computer. And one way to think about that really is an access layer on top. It's an expansion of the data that we're hosting for sure. There's data that you won't see there right now, like the Landsat and Sentinel archives um, that are all in progress. So there's that piece of it, but it's also not just more data. It is providing a programmatic data access layer, uh, both for accessing data doing spatial temple queries over that data and running large distributed computing jobs on that data without having a PhD in distributed computing. Um, and so check in with me again in a few months. Right now it is blob storage and we do our best to document that. Uh, and we hope that, and there's lots of cases where that actually is the right way to access the data. Um, but over the next few months, we will be uh, rolling out a more complete set of tools for doing querying and access on that data. Great, we look forward to that. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, appreciate you. your time with us. With that, I'm gonna move on to introduce our next speaker. Um, that is Leslie-Anne dupini Giroux. Um, she is a professor at the University of Vermont and is the Vermont State Climatologist. She uses remote sense data and statistics in her work, which spans across a number of climate hazards and severe weather um, with a focus on flooding and drought. We're especially thrilled to have Le Leslie with us as a preview to next year's summer meeting, um, which will hopefully be in Burlington, Vermont, where we had hoped to be this year. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Leslie. Thanks a lot for that introduction. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, because um, here in Burlington, it actually rained uh, recently and so a little bit of, of connectivity challenges going on um, here at this end, but if you can see my screen, okay. We're seeing it, Leslie. Okay. All right. So thank you for the invitation to kind of be segue between the, the ESIP online conference and the conference that's going to be held in 2021 here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm going to welcome you in advance and, and hope that you have as equally successful a meeting next year as you are having uh, right now. And my presentation is going to be a little bit different from the one that Dan gave because um, I'm a climatologist by training. Um, I use spatial climate as the lens through which I focus a lot of my uh, work. But most importantly, I work directly with stakeholders, be they K through 12 teachers and students, um, government agencies, state agencies. And so that's the lens through which I thought I would um, share a little bit about some of the weather, climate, um, and spatial climate implications looking at, at COVID-19 as, as a case study. So um, thinking back to the, the sort of subtitle subtext of, of this particular ESIP um, gathering in looking at, at data and, and, and trying to find these public partnerships that could be used to increase resilience and, and enhance the, the value of socioeconomic data. Those are some of the things that are particularly close to us as state climatologists in, in the landscape that we um, in, inhabit and in the, the, the people and communities and constituencies that we serve. And so what I'm gonna do is to, to, to pivot a little bit from some of the, the AI pieces that Dan was just talking about and bring it down a little bit to some of the actual observations, thoughts, ruminations, um, queries, concerns 
that we've seen in, in the last uh, four, five, six months as, as the pandemic has hit and the ways in which some of the, the data that we use are being um, accessed, how are, they being, how are they being interpreted? And are there different things that we need to be sort of thinking about when we, we try to increase that value of different types of, of socioeconomic data that are out there? So some of the things that we'll talk a little bit about are things like um, scales at which our, our, our data are being accessed and provided. We can talk about different types of, of vulnerability and, and the ways in which those sort of play out in accessing those data. And then when we provide different types of data, um, what are some of the metrics that we use and how do those get interpreted based on the scientific literacy of the, the people and the stakeholders that are actually using that? And so one of the things that we know right off the bat is that there were a lot of mobility um, issues. There was a lot of um, sort of reduction in either uh, production. There was a lot of um, reduction in, in travel, both personal, professional, commercial, as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown that a lot of of, of states, um, counties, and, and, and countries across the entire world um, experienced. And so one of the things that uh, we started noticing right off the bat since we're in the middle of that experiment is that there were greenhouse gas reductions. And so two of them that I'm gonna sort of uh, touch very, very briefly on today are carbon dioxide as well as nitrogen oxide. And so carbon dioxide, uh, the one that usually gets a lot of attention, um, there's an interesting piece of work that came out um, about a month ago, at the beginning of, of June, looking at the way in which, even though there were decreases in the uh, amount of carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere during the, the COVID-19 um, lockdown, the actual concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is at record levels. And so, what that speaks to is when we think about data, we think about the metrics that we're using, um, it, it helps us to understand and convey the message that yes, there were reductions, but no, there was not a, a, an abatement of carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere itself. And so the warming that is, is gonna continue as a result is, is in place because of that. And so how does that shake out in terms of helping um, our constituents um, understand a lot of the processes on a process dynamic perspective in looking at that. The one that perhaps received more attention was uh, the decreases in nitrogen dioxide that were observed in a number of places uh, from different parts of Asia um, into parts of Europe, into parts of, of North America as well. And one of the reasons why we were looking at, at, at nitrogen dioxide, which is produced from um, industrial processes, but also from the burning of fossil fuels and, and transportation, is that this is, is, is one particular um, greenhouse gas that is very, very, very dependent on weather conditions. And so one, one of the, the, the reasons that we saw a lot of that very quick um, response in terms of, of the reductions is that that dependency on, on the weather allowed you to actually see those changes across time. And so it was not just in, in Northern Italy, it wasn't just in parts of China, uh, it wasn't just in parts of um, Los Angeles, but also in places like the Northeast where, where we're, we're sitting here in, in Burlington, looking at how those decreases have sort of played out as a result. Now, that's only part of the story. Because there's that dependency on, on weather, we wouldn't have completed the story if we didn't look at that entire time series between when the lockdown occurred and where we are today. And so we're actually seeing a rebound in, in our values of the concentrations, concentrations in the entire troposphere we're looking at here um, over time. So with the upper diagrams here with some of the, the data that was gathered both by NASA as well as ESA in looking at those um, concentrate, concentration levels, between January, February, uh, and again into April and May. And because nitrogen dioxide is uh, a, a gas that is, is both, uh, it has the potential for um, causing um, air quality implications, but also causing um, uh, conversion to ozone, ground level ozone, and that in turn has its, its physiological components for us as human beings, but also for, for plant life. 
we can start to think about how does this kind of play out? What does this actually look like? So a couple of cities that we saw a lot of those changes really, really clearly across Los Angeles was one of them. And in, in looking at the um, ozone monitoring um, instrument information, see that reduction of about 40% in this upper uh, right diagram here, and then visually what it looked like between um, typical condition in LA, Los Angeles in 1998, compared to some of the conditions that we saw as a result of those reduction in, in a lot of those uh, gases like nitrogen dioxide in 2020, very, very visible in, in that particular instance there. And as we look at one way of trying to put all of these indicators together into one index, something like the air quality index or the AQI, for example, um, very nice time series that shows you not just the years across the uh, y-axis here, looking at it from a seasonal perspective in here. And again, a very clear scheme of green being times when it is good air quality and then going all the way into the reds and, and the, the purples, which is when things get particularly hazardous. And we saw that, see that um, seasonal framework of it being particularly pronounced in your summertime and then 2020 for that um, really uh, pronounced and, and historic stretch of, of good conditions. And so keep this particular color scheme in mind, green being good all the way through to reds and, and purples being bad because it's used in a number of other places, including um, parts of, of, of India where we saw a lot of that similar sort of um, change over time. Um, between uh, like 2019 and 2020 and that again reduction and what that means for air quality conditions so much so that you've probably seen some of these stories where they talked about being able to see the Himalayas for the first time and using that again that same color scheme that we just saw in Los Angeles using it um, to, to look at air quality indices across the world so in this case we're looking at, at Delhi and Again, their monitoring is taking place in different parts across the city itself. And one of the differences in the way that this information gets reported out, these data get reported out, are that it breaks it down, not just by whether it's good or bad, but what are the actual constituents? What are the actual gases or particulate matter that go into that, um, that air quality reading that is summarized as, as one particular value? So we're looking at across it here, and again, if, if we try and expand this um, across the entire world, for example, uh, we can look at IQ Air, which is based in Switzerland, and the way in which they can do that same sort of mapping, again, on, on a city level. So again, this is a sort of San Diego, Los Angeles region that you see in the upper left here. Similar sort of pattern, um, same information, different way of representing it. And one of the things that we're thinking about is how do we actually use this information and present it at different scales, whether it's from a city scale or a, a sort of continental scale that you're seeing on the right hand side here, or on a global scale with the ability to sort of do a, a zoom in down to an individual city and actually look at what those values mean for um, specific points in place. And so IQ Air has this uh, very nice uh, geovisualization that brings in a lot of those individual components. In this particular example that you're seeing here, it's um, particulate matter 2.5, particulate matter 10, and they've superimposed this on the, the wind map that, that we're uh, probably very, very familiar with. So that you, if you do go to that website, what you'll see is the ability to, to, to follow these traces of, of pollutants as they, they make their way across different um, wind flow patterns, whether they're surface or upper level patterns across in here. And since this was from yesterday, what you're seeing across the US is that a very high pressure dome that is keeping us locked in um, hot conditions uh, for this week before things start to break a little bit in here. So particulate matter, uh, PM, uh, 2.5 in particular, as well as PM10, um, are some of these other pieces that we are, are going to be concerned about. And part of that is because the, the concentrations of these very, very minute particles in the air um, sets up conditions 
that uh, expose people to increased um, risk and susceptibility and vulnerability to, to COVID-19 as an airborne disease. And so how do we bring all of this information into one place so that you get that geospatial nature of where these uh, concentrations are, these very, very fine particulate matter concentrations? And what does that mean for the vulnerability of the people who are um, exposed to these very, very large concentrations. And so um, some work that comes out of, of, of NCAR in looking at how do we sort of play this forward, feed this forward um, in sort of the um, use of, of WARF chem, the weather research and forecasting model, the, the chemistry version uh, of that. How do we sort of play that forward in helping to, to understand where the threats could be as this um, pandemic continues to occur? Now, all of this was, was taking place and evolving um, against a particularly interesting spring. And part of that had to do with the fact that uh, the, the polar vortex, which is the relationship between the pressure patterns at the poles versus what takes place in the, the mid latitudes, that was sort of falling apart as spring was sort of emerging. And so when the polar vortex um, decreases in, in value, what you end up with is more of a, a waviness in the jet stream. And part of that maybe this allows for stagnation of different types of events, um, heat in one place is cold in, in other places. And so um, as we look to see how that stagnation takes place, one of the things that we look for and look at are where are the, the jet streams being blocked? And so in the, the Western hemisphere, you see that there was a, a higher percentage of those days being blocked relative to what was taking place in the Eastern hemisphere. And as that sort of sets up and continues, it has implications for your wind flow patterns and where things are gonna be moving back and forth. And as we move from um, those blocking patterns into the, the spring and, and now into the summer, we are seeing that sort of evolution in, in looking at continued flow coming in from certain directions and what does that mean for us here on the ground. So all of these environmental pieces set up a, a very um, interesting set of tensions and dynamics between us as human beings and, and the environment in which we live. And one of the, the key stories from this week was also from um, around uh, the 4th of July was the heat waves. And so knowing that we are in particularly hot and humid conditions is important when we think about how that plays out um, with the COVID pandemic, because back in, in April, um, as we were starting to understand how weather and climate actually influence a lot of, of the patterns that are taking place with, with COVID-19, um, part of the thinking was this would be continue to be a, a challenge. And so um, we're, we're seeing that we are still setting records or approaching to setting records for, for heat conditions across not just the US, but across the globe as well. And the importance of this physiologically is, again, uh, very high temperatures, very high humidities, increase the vulnerability of um, populations who are either um, unable to shelter, so our homeless populations, our elderly populations, our populations who have pre-existing conditions. And so how do all of these pieces of where the information is coming in about temperatures, humidities, precipitation, uh, wind flow patterns, how does that help us to then um, serve the communities that we're actually looking at? So there's some great places. Sorry to interrupt you, but you have about a minute left. Not a problem. There are some great places that we are looking at for bringing all of this information together. Uh, the one on the left here is um, uh, some information from NOAA.gov, climate.gov, that brings all of the different types of data that are coming in from NOAA in one place. And if we think about the fact that during COVID-19 with fewer flights, um, some of the information we'd usually get um, that goes into weather models was not there that has implications for our data assimilations. So in bringing all of this home, um, when we think about uh, data, we think about data access, we think about how is it represented, we think about how is it interpreted, uh, we think about who um, needs the data, who has access to the data, there are a number of these implications from a 
a vulnerability perspective, from a scale perspective, from a, a system science perspective, in a way that helps us to, to understand um, some of the, the ways in which we can continue to be uh, flexible and nimble. So with that, um, here's my contact information and I thank you for being here. Thank you, Leslie Ann, really appreciate those talks. I'm not seeing any questions in Slido yet. There were a few comments in the chat. We have time for maybe one or two quick questions if anybody wants to um, add those in. I can tell you, I know that I'm excited to get to Vermont next summer. I mean, what a better place to be in the summertime. So I hope that the world can be in a place where we all can do that. Um, I see one from, uh, there's some, a, a conversation about um, excessive temperatures. Um, Steve says, seems like the excessive temperatures have driven people indoors for AC, causes the same problems that colder temps do as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Um, and definitely I've been hearing that also with, with Florida as people are, are going inside for air conditioning and how that, that shift's gonna happen. Um, mm -hmm. it, do you have ongoing work in that area? I think um, something that I saw yesterday was um, we're now looking at the, the actual circulation of air indoors and filtration. And so, um, yes, we move indoors to, to stay cool. But if the, the filtration and the circulation is not good, stagnation is going to be an issue as well. So um, one of the pieces that we need to kind of keep in, in mind here. Great. Well, not seeing any other questions, I think I am going to turn it over to Megan, uh, who's going to tell us more about the research showcase. Um, and I do believe that Dan and Leslie will be available in the main room here for the plenary for further discussion if the questions come in. All right, I have found the unmute button. Um, so Susan, before I tell folks about this next uh, segment, I just wanted to add my welcome um, to the team. I'm really looking forward to working with you. I've enjoyed getting to know you um, so far. And so I just want to add my, my enthusiasm um, and thank you for, for leading this plenary today. Um, I want to remind everyone that you can stop by and meet and talk with Susan and actually the president as well following this plenary at 1.15 p.m. Eastern time in the president's hangout and somebody will uh, put a link in the chat for that um, and we'll, we'll give you a, a notification when that's starting. Um, and you can also find the link in Sketch as well. So for the rest of this plenary, you'll notice we have a little more time. Uh, back by popular demand, we're excited to bring you another opportunity to engage in questions and answer session uh, with the research showcase presenters. They've contributed uh, posters and demos on a wide range of topics to our virtual research showcase gallery. And today, many of them will be standing by their presentations in their own individual Zoom rooms. Um, so we're going to lead you through a series of eight minute rotations just over the next 30 minutes. You'll have a chance to speak live to some presenters, but even if the presenters are not live in their rooms, um, there is a Google Doc associated with each presentation and you're welcome to leave comments and feedback for anything you see there. And we're going to lay out another challenge for you today to interact uh, with at least four presentations including at least one that's not in your wheelhouse, meaning something you don't spend um, your average day thinking about, and one by somebody that you don't know. Um, and again, we want you to leave a comment or question or ask a comment if you or ask a question or leave a comment if you can. Um, we have time for four rounds. Uh, so for the first three rounds, we're going to ask you to focus on the first 12 presentations, and then you know, we'll ask you to go to the second 12. And this is a way that um, the presenters can also jump in and see others' presentations as well. So for the first round, we ask you to choose a presentation in the range of number one through number 12. And again, when you get over that space, it'll be a little bit clearer what you need to do. Um, just a quick review, when you enter the research showcase space, um, hopefully somebody can pop a link in the chat box. Um, you can click on the presentation number on the left that you're interested in viewing. So here I've clicked presentation number two and to talk to that person if they are live there, um, you can click the join video for presentation two button. I've tried to put two asterisks uh, before the titles for those where I know people will be live. Um, so that'll give you a little indication if you can have live conversation. And if there's not somebody there for every presentation, there's also this learn more and comment tab um, where you can leave a question or your thoughts. So without further ado, I wanna thank you all and we will share a link to uh, the research showcase in the chat box. We invite you to head over there and choose which presentation you'd like to start with. And again, we encourage you to start in the range of presentation one through presentation 12 for this first round. 
So Megan, I've put a link in the chat. Um, I see people starting to head over. Um, and I also have put a link in the live chat and Kiko chat. So, um, and Dan and Leslie Ann, if you wanna hang out in the main room for a few minutes, if people do wanna have conversations with either of our plenary speakers, um, we would we would love to encourage that too. We have a few minutes before that first round and the research showcase starts. Um, I will be here quietly checking my email and listening for my name. Nice. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> um, Leslie Ann, we did have one more question for you. Actually, um, quite a few have been coming in um, in Slido for you. Um, so one was curious about your thoughts on interactions between science and policy. Okay, Leslie, yeah. did, 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 is, does the, the person who asked that, is, is the person still there or? Yes, I think okay. the person is still there. Okay. All right, so could you read the whole question again for me? You're the, as a, the state climatologist, I write for Vermont, and in, in that way, do you interact at all with, you know, state government or state policies or, you know, the, the general interaction between science, science data, whether earth science data or COVID mm -hmm. data or whatever, and, and the government seems to be a little fraught these days. Right. So a um, number of ways of, of answering that. So part of uh, being state climatologist means that you have to provide outreach, education and support for all Vermonters, including state legislators. So I work very closely with a number of state agencies like the um, Emergency Management Agency, Agriculture, Forestry Agency, but also directly with um, uh, various subcommittees of the Senate. So if they have a particular call for testimony, I would I go and I provide that. Um, and it allows me to sort of bring not just my research, but also the, the work that I was able to do as the lead author for the Northeast chapter for the ninth National Climate Assessment into the, the Vermont space. And so um, sitting at that nexus where you keep your eye out on what the latest science is and then be a translator or whatever it needs to, to be at the policy level, at the state level is, is one sort of two-way direction that, that we play. And I think all state climatologists pretty much sit in that space. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the climate assessment. A lot of us in ESIP know the, uh, you know, the, the people that have worked on, on the, on managing the data associated with that. And right. it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, piece of work of, of trying to um, document really, really well and in a very trustworthy, hopefully way, um, observations and sharing them with a wide variety of stakeholders. So thank you very much for your help with that. Well, thank you, Blake, and thank you for saying that because I've been involved with the Cl National Climate Assessment for three rounds now, and each round it's gotten so much improved. And it's, it's just amazing to see um, where the trajectory has gone. And incidentally, the call for the next climate assessment just came out. And so if, if you're interested, I can send you that sort of call for information um, because they're gonna take it, kick it up a notch in terms of not just the data, not just all of the models and the pieces that go in, but also how does it get represented on the, on the front end, right? Because there's a lot of thinking in, in, in geovisualization in terms of info visualization. How do you bring those pieces together so that it's, it's received in the way that um, it was actually designed, right? Because we as scientists know certain ways of dealing with data, but it, it, the, the climate assessment is, 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 is for everybody. And so how do you make sure that that translation actually occurs? Yeah, and, and of course, you know, there's a significant portion of that um, audience who is uh, a little bit, um, uh, let's say, skeptical about mm -hmm. about the science and the data. Um, right. Yeah. So it's 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 a very interesting challenge in terms of well documented oh, figures and results. Yeah. Yeah. It's great work because it 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 it's, it it has to um, conform to the. Information Quality Act, the IQA. 
And so there are a number of these, you know, guideposts that it has to hit consistently. Leslie, yep. and we had a question building on Ted's question. Um, someone had asked, they're curious to know your thoughts on how we could leverage what we are learning from this spring to help people understand human impact on the environment and in turn improve our behavior. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, the leverage. So it, it's interesting the experiment that we live through and are currently living through. And I think um, it's causing a lot of, of sort of soul searching and self-reflection and digging deep. And it, it's, it's one of the things that you, you're noticing a lot more of um, self-awareness of your own actions, but also because we're, we're, we're now in this environment like this, this sort of face-to-face -face, um, in a Zoom environment that actually sort of removes layers a little bit and um, has the potential for raising accountability because you are, you're not being distracted by all the other stuff, but you are looking people in the eye, right? And, and so to the extent that we can sort of continue to, 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 to work through that and to use the best parts of, of Zoom and online meetings to actually continue those, those conversations and to, to capture a lot of the sort of creativity that came out of the last two or three months because we were forced to do it, what are those good pieces and what are the hard things that we are now able to wrestle with a little bit closer and a little bit freer because we are now in this type of environment and then take that and move it to the next level. And so I think that's going to be the challenge. And I don't see things going back to the way that they were because we've, we've now been sort of like thrust into an environment where we can do things a little bit better. Yeah, I am going to uh, use this opportunity to remind people the research showcase um, is starting. There are 37 amazing posters and you can have great um, small group discussions on those posters. So if you want to head over there, I do have one more question for Leslie Ann. Um, Dave Jones says, we have found that there is no such thing as a quote, one stop shop for data being available centrally, which means that data should be offered via web services. Do you see any specific locations that are offering these data services? And that was for me or for Dan? Uh, that I think is for you, but Dan can weigh in too. Oh, <laughs> okay. So I totally agree with that because whenever somebody asks me a question, I usually have three or four top places that I, I, I recommend sending people to. And I think it's because every, either every agency or every group of people does it a little bit differently. And so the only way you're gonna get a one-stop shop is if you asked everybody what they needed. And so since we never asked everybody what they needed, we will still have individual portals that are trying to serve populations to the best of their ability. And so to the extent that, you know, we can use something like ESIP, which brings and amasses together such a powerhouse of different ways of knowing and ways of doing and ways of being and ways of serving the, the data. I think this is probably one of the closest places to getting something like a one-stop shop because you don't have to be all and do all, but you can port all. Excellent. Um, we did have another comment. Oh, one more came in. Um, Ethan McMahon from EPA is asking, how can we think strategically about these problems? We're seeing co-benefits where acting on one area shows a positive impact in other areas. But what about approaches are going, but what approaches are going to help in the long term beyond helping with the recent attention on COVID? So I've been thinking about this um, from an emergency management perspective because you know, in, in sitting and, and seeing the, the rapid pivot that we needed to do, for example, as educators, um, one of the things that occurred to me is there are some um, frameworks that are already in place that we can use to help us um, either address situations that are similar to COVID or think strategically as we move through it. And emergency management is one that, um, I'm closest to because of that need to constantly be looking at uh, multiple stressors and multiple ways of responding. And so it, it allows you to bring together um, multiple disciplines and multiple facets and multiple agencies to respond to a common problem. And so 
I, I said back in May when I gave a version of this particular talk that using a lot of the emergency management strategies where you, you think about who needs to be at the table, what's the common problem, how do we address it, uh, how do we address it now, but how do we deploy ahead of time so that we're not getting caught with our socks down is, is, is a framework that I think is, is something that could be applied to, to, to not just this situation, but, but any other situation where you need to be like this and on your toes and always responding, but trying to get ahead of the problem. Yeah, there's another question that I actually think builds off what you were just saying there too. Um, building off that last question, we now know what the federal government is capable of regarding a national non-military crisis, in particular, the first $3 trillion aid package. What does this tell us about what is possible policy-wise at the federal level pertaining to climate change? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I'm not sure. Um, Read the question one more time for me. Uh, it's basically I can, I can saying, oh, go ahead. Uh, it's Steve Diggs. Um, so oh. looking at how fast Congress is mobilized to do the first aid packet and how they're coming together even with the second package, there are things that transcend this, this uh, partisan bickering that we've suffered through for, for decades. Um, and we keep looking to the federal government for uh, resources to mitigate climate change. And it seems like it's a question of motivation. Um, more than politics. If the, if the problem seems big enough and we come with the correct data stated in the right way, then we might see federal action. But I think to date we have been treating the problem and expressing the problem as if we were talking to our other scientific colleagues and it doesn't seem to resonate with Congress and rise above the noise. So that's kind of what I was getting at with that, uh, that statement. Okay. What can we do? Right. And so um two ways of, of answering that, Steve. I think um, the first one that popped into my head is um, congressional staffers um, are a key piece in, in this equation that, that you're, you're asking about, because I've worked really closely with a number of congressional staffers here in Vermont. And um, one of the things that they, that's part of, of their, um, uh, their, their job functioning is to, to sort of stay on top of of the various uh, pieces of science and the various pieces of environmental lit, um, law and, and so on that are sort of bubbling up so that they can then take that to uh, whether it's um, uh, a senator or a congressperson. And so um, having a, a very close relationship with, with, with staffers is critically important because that's one way of, of helping the, the, the science and the information to bubble up. Um, the other piece that um, you were talking about and that okay, I just forgot it for a sec. Um, so your staffers and, oh, the other piece is, is, is looking to what the states are already doing. And so I became really, really aware of that and conscious of that in working on the national climate assessment when we have two chapters that are, are specifically devoted, one to adaptation and one to mitigation. And in, in looking at how those chapters sort of came together, that's where you can see um, the tremendous amount of work that's actually taking place on a state level, but also more importantly, on a regional level. And so that's been going on for at least four or five, if not more years. And so to the extent that it can be like this, where you've got the sort of bottom up um, taking place, um, and top down coming down. I think there's a lot more of this taking place right now. And so if we can tap into a lot of that, um, help support it, uh, promote it and, and learn from it, then um, that's, that's gonna have more of a groundswell than you know, um, waiting only for stuff to come from the top down. Excellent. Um, someone else has asked if you could share more of your thoughts on how to bring the quote, right people to the table. Um, when responding to an emergency. In particular, how do we think through who are the right people and how to get them together in a timely manner? Mm -hmm. um, so I would first start with connectors. So connectors are networkers. These are the folks who know a whole lot of people because whenever a new group forms, the first thing, you know, regardless of if you invite five people or 50 people, first question should be, thank you all for coming, who's missing? 
because invariably, but invariably somebody will be missing and it behooves you to get the full scope whether it's the full set of disciplines, whether it's the full set of agencies, whether it's if, if there's a, a hierarchy going on, all levels of the hierarchy to the extent that it makes sense, it, you need to ask that question first. And then that's the only way you will know whether you have the right people at the table or not. Because for example, if you've got a task force and the point is to get the information out, but there's nobody there from communications or from outreach, or somebody who talks to the reporters, then you're talking to yourself. I absolutely agree with that. I, I was really pleased in a, in a discussion the other day when we were talking about water quality in Flint, Michigan. You know, someone said, where are the epidemiologists? Where, you know, in, 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 in this community, I've seen that just in the last week and a half. How do we bring in these people? How do, how do we connect with, with this community or that community? And I absolutely agree with you in terms of looking at the, the multidisciplinary approach, you know, who yeah. are the other skill sets that are needed to fully amplify the message and get it where it needs to go. Right. Right. For sure. Well, if others have questions, we can just kind of make this into more of a dialogue if people just want to, um, you know, speak up. Any question? any more questions for Dan? Dan, I'm actually, I'm, I'm completely thrilled, but also torn that at this moment when you're here with, with us, that um, my former colleague, Jeff Allenby and your colleague, Lucas Joppa are doing a different webinar. I was like, what a great small world that there's multiple amazing meetings happening at the same time and you can't always be multiple places at once. <laughs> well, I, I just think it's tremendous, Susan, um, the power and the ability to have this much engagement for this length of time in this number of formats, I think it's it, it speaks to the, the the power of the community. So kudos to everybody at ESIP. I couldn't agree more. Okay. Not seeing well questions um so i'm gonna put my um my email back in the chat so that if anybody um would like to send me a note or think about after we log off make sure it's still, it's still. Great, thank you for that, Leslie Ann. No problem. Well, if there aren't further questions, I'm gonna go pop over and check out the research showcase. Cause I gotta say for, I mean, poster sessions where you're not in a loud crowded room, it's pretty great. <laughs> you're probably gonna retain more, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to, to speak and looking forward to seeing you folks here in Burlington next year. Absolutely and have fun with, what is it called? The Funding Fridays tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. No problem. Take care.